Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another Insider Podcast, and I am very pleased to introduce again on the show, Nikul, who runs Qualcomm's automotive business. How are you, my friend? Good to see you, Pat. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's been an awesome 24 hours. I mean, yes. listen, you know, my background uh, is products and more products, and I love products and announcements. And um, yesterday, I attended your first ever investor day for automotive, the business that you run and you had it at an incredible venue, the classic car club of uh, Manhattan. And, you know, diversification is a very important theme for the company. Automotive is something that we've been focused on for a very long time now. And uh, business is going great. We are very relevant to every automaker today. So it made sense for us to come and you know, share a little bit more about our strategy, about our story, where we are headed. Uh, Qualcomm CEO, Cristiano Maman, uh, said that this is the graduation uh, of the business. And while he didn't give you this name, I'm going to give you the name. You are the $30 billion man, okay? And if you can talk a little bit why $30 billion is a big thing and it was a big part yesterday. Well, you know, I think uh, the $30 billion number is, uh, I think we've more than doubled in the last 12 months. We've added about 10 billion in the last two months. Uh, so uh, it is staggering, but it is also an indicator as to how quickly the auto industry is actually embracing technology, how quickly it's transforming, and frankly, how important these bets are becoming for automakers. We had a fantastic lineup of CEOs yesterday and uh, these were CEOs, uh, you know, that represent uh, luxury brands, uh, mass market brands, uh, you know, really across the board. And the message really is, uh, we work with everybody. Uh, they all need to accelerate their transformation and they need partners to be able to go do that. And uh, it's a complicated business. So, you know, the pipeline is uh, really, I think, an indicator of, uh, you know, what more is to come. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny, people, you know, your competitors and people can have skepticism, but it all goes away with that 30 billion uh, number. Uh, what I think our viewers and listeners would be really, would love to hear from you about is which one of the key megatrends uh, really puts you in this situation to have this type of success that you've had with your business? So there is more than one, obviously. Uh, look, I think we've spent a lot of time working very closely with many automakers over the last five to seven years as they start to really understand what they want to build with the vehicle platforms that they are investing in. And there has been a, uh, you know, there has been a choice that automakers have had to make in terms of what they buy versus what they make. As the transition continues to move towards making in-house, the need to be able to lean on a partner that will actually not just support you, but evolve their roadmap, design it to your specific needs is a very important differentiator. I think the other major thing that works in our favor is that we do control a large number of the technologies that are needed to build the modern day car. Uh, there, there isn't much that I can think of that we don't have. So for us to be able to have a conversation really across the board on any product category, any dimension, any you know, power consumption, right. software, virtualization, safety. Uh, those are new muscles that we have developed, but those are very important experiences for us to have in the company. And that I think resonates very well as automakers have to make some pretty complicated partnership decisions. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think everybody knew that you would be very successful in telematics and communications because you had been in that business for 20 years. Uh, there was a healthy dose of skepticism around the Dash, uh, but you're number, currently the number one market share in the Dash. So no questions about that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your ADAS and uh, FSD uh, strategy and, yeah. and how it's different. You really laid it out there yesterday in more yeah. detail than I had ever seen. Yeah. And I was really pleased to see that. Yeah. So look, I think uh, the ADAS uh, uh, learnings actually come quite a bit from the digital cockpit learnings. Uh, and 
the cockpit is actually this very interesting space in the car which has to deal with safety and consumer behavior together. And it's becoming more and more complex because as you add more safety features into the car, you have to be able to visualize. One thing that we did early on was to make sure that every technology block that was relevant, we designed it with the safety concept in mind. Right. Our GPUs, our DSPs, the CPUs, the, uh, you know, the AI accelerators. Uh, what that allowed us to, to then do is to build platform software that was really, uh, in, it abstracted away what application you will run because the application really needs to be able to be, uh, you know, to keep in mind what it is doing. Is it running a safety application to visualize, to actuate? Right. Uh, the roadmap that we have built now uh, has a couple of different vectors on which it operates. At the silicon level, and the platform software level. The approach that we take it is if customers want to be able to write their own stacks, like uh, GM does with the Lyric that we showed yesterday, uh, we will support that. We will support the customers to be able to go bring their own differentiation. We acquired Arriver about six months ago. That was very specifically for computer vision and drive policy. Right. We are co-designing now silicon and computer vision stacks to be able to address the computer vision problem should customers wish to go uh, take that. And that is very important to address a very large segment of the entry tier population. And then the drive policy stack that we are jointly developing with BMW, that allows us to be able to build a complete solution. So we really have uh, kind of our, uh, you know, we are targeting uh, the opportunity to be able to address many different transitions that might happen in the market with some solution or the other. And as we do that, we will keep learning from the market. We'll keep advancing these products. And so I think it's a robust strategy because customers do find uh, some part of the other in our portfolio that they can solve with. Well, it really sounds like you've built up kind of a, it's not even a good, better, best. It's more like three different modalities that your customers want to operate in, right? If you want a full solution, yeah we have this for you. Yeah. If you want building blocks, we have this for you. And then we have something in between uh, for those who pick uh, an alternative route. And and that's, by the way, I, I, I'm thinking of your competitors right now and how they address the market. And in a way, you, you're you you're able to address it uh, in a similar way, um, but you have three modalities, not one modality. And I do think that's a strength for you. It is difficult to compete with an approach like this, and I'll tell you why. If you think about safety, uh, it is becoming standard at a lot of the entry tiers. You have to have it. So then the next issue is cost, and uh, can you innovate? Can you have an open platform? Well, that's what we will create, but we will also uh, look for ways to combine cockpit solutions and information safety solutions because the fabric supports it, the platform software will, that addresses the affordability uh, segment. At the high end, where uh, automakers are now redesigning their organizations, their teams, to really have a single team that is focused on the cockpit, on, uh, on automated driving, that's now a software problem statement because they want one underlying hardware platform and platform software that allows them to be able to write those applications. We're able to address that as well. And then for those that wish to buy the stack from us, we are partnering with uh, you know, one of the leading automakers in the world to jointly develop that, and we will, you know, happily work with the OEMs that want to uh, take that part. So, um, yeah, you know, the approach that we have to take as we build these strategies is not something that is relevant for 12 months or 24 months. It is a decade-long strategy. We know the different OEMs will move at different points in time. They have a lot of different uh, decisions that they have made previously that they have to follow through on. Uh, but you know. That's why the acquisition was important, the partnership with BMW was important, the silicon strategy was important, it all plays very well together. Nicole, yesterday at your event, you talked about some of the changing dynamics when it comes to architecture uh, on compute. Yeah. We also talked a little bit earlier about the ability to have a central compute unit and then have containers to run different kinds of, of software yeah. and even different types of operating systems, yeah. which, Interestingly enough, um, data centers have made popular and, and rugged and in, industrialized. Yeah. You talked yesterday, gave a little bit of a hint, a sneak peek into what you're calling Snapdragon Ride Flex SOC. Yeah. I know you can't talk a lot about it, 
but uh, what can can you share? Yeah. Well, you know, it's ha this is actually not new in terms of a concept because we already today run multiple operating systems, even on our digital cockpit platforms. We have to because uh, a lot of customers want a real-time operating system for the cluster and they want to use, uh, you know, AOSP or uh, Android for consumer apps. So this is something that we support at scale today. I think what is starting to happen uh, with Flex, and we'll share more details, uh, you know, towards CES, but really the idea there is when you are running a full-fledged uh, safety application, you need to be able to adhere to functional safety requirements to uh, sort of to the specific uh, constraints around which a safety application has to be written. And that requires a very tight co-design of the silicon, the fabric, and the software that you're actually running together. So these are, uh, this is a new area because this isn't something that, uh, you know, has been done before. But the idea of being able to have virtualization or, uh, you know, having containers to host, uh, you know, different types of uh, app ecosystems or functionality such that uh, they, you know, such that they don't compete, they don't conflict with each other. You run uh, fault tolerant systems separately from consumer applications. Something that we've been actually doing for quite some time. It is a fairly standard part of the platform software that we provide. So it will get to the next level of complexity because of the types of applications that are now going to be running concurrently. Yeah, I did think it was interesting. Uh, not only did you talk about your, your own software, uh, you talked about software that you're designing uh, with BMW for that next level of autonomy, but you also had Google and Amazon uh, uh, on stage, with a, which I thought was interesting, because in a way you're creating an ecosystem for everybody to 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 play here. Is that is that the right way to look at it? It is, and if you think about it, you know, it it is reflective of the way that we work in the automotive space, because uh, especially when especially when you're talking about the cabin being something that needs to be differentiated, there is a massive ecosystem that is, uh, you know, the consumer ecosystem that we deal with every day. That definitely plays a role in terms of what that looks like, but it ha but it has to sit alongside an automotive ecosystem. So, you know, I think what you saw yesterday in terms of the lineup of uh, customers and partners that we had, it is reflective of the way that we are actually engaged with the market. And one of the things that actually differentiates us compared to a number of uh, others is that the solutions are not necessarily Qualcomm only solutions. We provide platforms. They are uh, very scalable, they're very broad, and they're designed for other partners to innovate with right. us, and in fact, innovate with us multi-generationally. So it's not like you can provide a version of your software today, and then next time we see you is in the next generation of silicon. No, right. that same generation will evolve two, three, four, five, six years down, and those are the contracts that we sign. So. It's a very different approach when you are starting to get into this level of complexity. Uh, one thing that really stood out uh, when I looked at your slides talking about the software and the ecosystem was you're not just a North American or Western European play. No. You're a global player. Uh, and I saw, you know, quite frankly, some content vendors that I had to look up uh, that, that might be uh, in Asia, South yeah. Asia. Yeah. Uh, does that give you an advantage compared to your competitors? See, I think uh, a big advantage for uh, us being in the automotive business is that the global footprint we have in mobile actually is a big advantage because uh, what mobile gets you very accustomed to is to be able to have a large set of partners that you have to uh, lean on for regionalization, for uh, local ecosystems, content, uh, app stores. And in China, for example, we have a tremendous set of partners, Archer Mai and Thundersoft, we work with who are our scaling partners. Right. We have similar partners in other parts of the world that allow us to be able to lean on them where we need to be able to scale up or where we have to go do something very unique for a customer. So, uh, you know, and then I think the other piece which is really important is all of our customers uh, sell cars all over the world. So <laughs> even if they are based in North America yes. or uh, uh, Germany, they are actually have uh, customers globally. So it is very similar to our uh, heritage in terms of how we engage with uh, customers. Yeah, I see it as a big advantage. And yeah. once again, uh, your strength in smartphones giving you strength in, in autos. And it's so ironic to me that probably five or six years ago, people were saying, well, they just do smartphones. What, what advantage uh, uh, do they have? But 
What's clear to me, and, and I think we've seen this in the current environment too, is supply chain matters, yeah. right? Global player, and, and there are some challenges with doing some bespoke technologies on lagging uh, type of, of, of nodes and being able to get access. It's interesting, I didn't hear many people at all saying they couldn't get parts from you when they needed it. And I understand that there's a leading edge side uh, for things like uh, compute, and there's kind of a lagging edge side for let's say RF or, or sensors. But I think you did a really good job taking care of, of business for your customers. And, and to me, uh, when I talk to a lot of them, you know, they want to directly interface with technology companies now yep. and, and foundries. Uh, it's incredible how much this industry has changed, Nicole. So I'm going to ask you the same question I always ask uh, at the end of our, our talks. What's next? What do we need to be looking forward to? I understand there's a lot of work yeah. to do. Uh, to execute, but but what should we be thinking about for the next two or three months? Well, yeah. Uh, looking or looking forward to. Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, several things. Uh, I think the roadmap that we now have that we're going to announce uh, in more detail in the coming months is of high interest to uh, the entire industry. So a uh, lot of key decisions are going to get made over the next nine to 12 months. A lot of those conversations are ongoing or are about to start. Uh, so I think uh, you know there are big awards, big design choices in front of uh, customers. Uh, we are spending a lot of time on the stack, on uh, making sure that we are able to hit our timelines uh, and our milestones. So that I think is a clear execution focused goal. Uh, we are spending a lot of time on services. Uh, especially as we start to take the chassis to adjacent opportunities. I think there is, an, there is uh, an approach that we can take that is a little different from a traditional hardware first approach. And so that's something that we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on. And, you know, really, there is a long list of things that we can do that we have to keep doing just as adjacencies to the domains that we have created. So. Uh, Look, it's a super exciting time. It's a super exciting space. And working closely with customers continuously allows us to figure out where else we could innovate, where else are common problem statements occurring that provide us an opportunity to be able to bring something different. Yeah, I'll tell you what, if, uh, if you spend any time here out on the streets here in, uh, in Nomad District, there's bike lanes, That's right. there's bikes. That's right coming down at 30 miles an hour. So it seems like even, even the possibility of adding safety to Absolutely. a bicycle would Absolutely. be something that would be uh, Absolutely. Uh, interesting and leverage that. Yeah. So see you at CES? Yes. Okay, good. Good to see you. Thank you very much for you having too. me. You too, really appreciate the time and uh, look forward to chatting again and having you on the show. Thank you. This is Pat Moorhead with Nicole DeGaulle from Qualcomm runs the automotive business, a very successful one with a $30 billion design pipeline and extra $10 billion in the last two months. Very exciting stuff. This is Pat Moorhead. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button. If you'd like to comment, say some stuff to uh, myself or Nicole, you can find us both on Twitter. Have a great day.